sat down with Paul Atkins, who runs Atkins Photo Lab in Adelaide. I'd been a client from when I ran my photography business full time and became quite fond of Paul. You'll soon see why I find him so lovable. I've always seen Atkins as an iconic service provider for photographers in Adelaide, and so it was a real privilege to chat to Paul. Hope you enjoy this episode. So, hi, Paul Atkins. Who is Paul Atkins? Give me the 30-second spill on yourself. Good luck with that. Um, (laughs) I'm famous for over-talking. So, I've always felt my family business defined me, which sounds awful. It doesn't, but it's quick. My grandfather's business was started in the 30s and I'm the caretaker of it at the moment, um, which sounds like it's a big thing, um, but it's just what it is we're at. Uh, so I, I work for myself. I work with my wife. Uh, my children also work in the business, as I did. We've got around 25 staff. Um, I started in the business when I was 12, but I did go through and do uni and that kind of did business and all those sorts of things. So I'm not total child labour. <laughs> um, victim of my father was the same. He started when he was 14, So, but his was he left school at year 10. Uh, and so our business has evolved over the years and uh, my life has evolved around the business in the letting go of pretty much that feeling I may have implied that I'm the caretaker of this business in the sort of easing of what that actually means being a person taking on a family thing. My life has gotten better in the last few years when I've realised that I can't maintain it in the way that I expected they all wanted it maintained, all the ghosts. Oh, wow, yeah. Because, you know, what, what's that I forget what the term is? Something's bullying by ghosts. Um, um, I don't know, there's a term. We, mm. At any rate, that, that, you know, it means like you feel obliged to do what your ancestors did or to keep them yeah. happy. You want, oh, they're dead. They don't. And they want you to be happy, so... Was there some guilt in that as God, well? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, massive. Yeah. Um, and I fought it for so many years. And the hardest thing was that I put my wife through all of that. Mm. And she could see it from a mile away. Like, anyone can see that sort of stuff. But you try and tell the person who's who's going through it. And they have to go through the series of steps that will help you through to realise it yourself. You can't be forced into understanding something. Yeah. Um, so that, in some ways, it defines me. So I, I found that getting away, and the, the dead key that I wasn't meant to be the only thing I did in my life was I escaped from the business as often as I could. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to live in the hills, and I got into boats, and everything that would mean I couldn't be at work every day. Mm. Um, yeah, I know it's kind of leaking I didn't out of it. Realize that. And yeah. then when you have kids, you know, kids kind of. They really mess. They're wonderful and I love them. I'd never go backwards, but they mess up everything. Like you think you got your plans uh-huh. right. Uh-huh, yes. And you get railroaded. I hear you. And so I kind of dropped all the good stuff and then then you need all the money that kids need. Yeah. And so then your focus goes in the business and you go, oh, how do we make it work? And then it doesn't. And then you feel like a failure and yet your kids are succeeding and yet you're not. And you know, so wow, Paul! Yeah. Know, this is awesome for the first um, few minutes. <laughs> well, like, this is who I am. I mean, you said how many minutes did you want? <laughs> oh no, like I mean, I just uh, I'm so glad that it's just coming out naturally for you. Lots, and of, therapy. <laughs> Lots of therapy. <laughs> By the way, those glasses are cool. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, it's funny you say that. When we chose them, uh, I really liked them because they look like an election post that someone had drawn the glasses on. Yes. Because they're matte. Yeah, They're yeah, like someone's got right. a texture on a thing. And I thought that was kind of funny. But thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was, you know, picking out something to wear today and dropped a coat hanger on my face. <laughs> so What? <laughs> so I'm like using eye concealer. Eye it's on this thing. side, but actually should have been on that side, but I just feel more comfortable on this side. So... That was a nice little um, incident. That's tough. So Pretty. you pulled the thing off the, just, the like rack. Fell and on, came yeah, it felt like the wooden one. So yeah. it could have been a lot worse. Yeah, well, you got your eyes, I can see. I don't think you mentioned what your business is. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, we print for professional photographers. Um, and we predominantly do. We've tried to be lots of things to lots of different people, but the essence of our business and the way it's been for at least sort of 50 years was focused on working for professional photographers. We do see the general public in the building. We see enthusiastic photographers, uh, contemporary artists. Mm -hmm. We deal with uh, all sorts of people, but our bread and butter is 
mums photographing their babies as professionals, um, other people's babies, weddings, portraits. That's what puts the bread on the table for all of us. And it's Atkins Photo Lab. Yep. Atkins.com.au is the URL. So right. if you go to that, you'll see the aesthetic and the feel for what we are now. It's a pretty good website in that it's sort of – there's a lot of words on there and there's a lot of feelings in words on there mm-hmm. and that is all our ourselves laid bare very much. Geneva here with a quick insert. Rather spontaneously, I had asked Paul during the pre-roll if he wanted to promote anything today – and I think his thoughtful response gives a nice insight into his genuine character. This is what he had to say. You've run out your own business and you know what it's like when you, you feel you should be selling because everyone tells you the only way you get money <laughs> is by asking for it. Yeah. And promoting yourself. Uh, and, of course, it feels awkward and awful to do that, but it's a part of being self-employed that you need to do that. Well, I'm in a bit of a luxurious position that, and I've always felt this way, whether it's because I'm just lucky because we've got this business that's been around for a while, that I don't have to do that and I don't want to do that. I don't feel comfortable doing it. So just being here with you and talking to you, um, that's doing the job of getting the word out about the business. Mm. And I don't want to be one of those business. I want the biz- people to come to us. I don't want to have to go and drag them but I'm very very lucky and um that's uh yeah lucky blessed Mm. whatever you want to call it you know I don't have to go and chase that right now so Mm. that's why I don't want to sit here and pitch stuff to your audience all right noted but I like that isn't that don't they call that the new way of selling I, I don't know how new it is Surely um, when society began and we lived in villages and I grew potatoes and you made some decent mead, some wine out of honey, you'd come to me and I'd give you some potatoes and, you know, you'd give me some mead and vice versa, right? So, but we'd live together in this little village. We were friends and the place was small and you do that for one another, don't you? So I think that's the beginning of time. If Mm. anything, it's maybe going back to what it was rather Mm. than being the new thing perhaps. Yeah, yeah, I get you. People smell sales a mile away, Mm -hmm. don't they? And it's so icky with me and that's why I've never been good at it. Like um, if there's a way that I can reframe it in my mind so I don't see it as a sale, it's just like Mm. natural conversation, but I'm not quite there yet meanwhile I'm still in the village I'm like that story you just told I'm picturing it I'm like don't you think that I mean I think if we think of society that way as a as as a a village of sorts you know you're going to go out and you're going to you know you see a weed in the ground of someone else's place you're going to pull it up or tell them about it Mm. you know you're not going to um just ignore it you're going to try and help if you can if you can afford to or whatever you're going to help if you can um, you're going to do things that other people want out of you. You're not going to do sort of dumb stuff for yourself because that won't help those people around you um, grow or whatever it is. Mm. So you try and do those little things and you try and bear them in mind when you're living without giving yourself to them because well, that's not healthy, is it? I mean, you've mm. you've been through a lot of personal growth. I can see a wall of fabulous books. Uh, <laughs> Don't don't define me by my book titles, and I have. Unfortunately, not. <laughs> unfortunately, that actually really does happen. You, you are what you read and eat, and all. That yeah, stuff. It's pretty funny because, like, my self help is all on one shelf, and it's just like, okay, this lady is going through some stuff. Hey, we all are. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm 54 this year, and everybody's going through stuff. And if you're not going through stuff, you're haven't got your eyes open. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You don't realise what it is. I like that. And you used to be called Atkins Technicolor. Correct. And I just remember like kind of watching from afar, the whole, the rebranding was one of the most, well, would you call it a rebranding? Yeah. That was just one of the most interesting rebrands I'd seen um, because it was a real change and a real, like a real transformation. I would love to know more about that. Like what 
Did you have to do some soul searching to get that yeah, happening? Great questions uh, and a great story. Um, you know, I I'm, I'm apologise. I don't mean to say that, like, we have a great story because we went through this process to find all this stuff out. So my dad and I always did a lot of business development together. Always went up to any seminar you could get to. Like I'm sure you did too, Jen. Mm. You know, you just go along and you you get pulled from here to there, and you're going to be like this person and like that person. And mm. um, and then I, Kate and I got into. Well, Kate alerted me to the panic that we business isn't great and we're not going to be able to. This is not going to work. We we can't afford to have a house and kids and put kids through a school that we might want to or have holidays like we want to, you know. We could see this sort of dead end coming up and it certainly felt like that. So I went to the Family Business Association and I said, how? And they got us an accountant. This is independent of Dad. Mm -hmm. So he's still working the business, very much involved. Um, he was managing director still. I was, I think I may have had some shares at that stage. but And this would have been uh, mid-2000s, something like that. And so the, that led to an accountant coming in going, oh, yeah, you've got some problems coming. Um, have you heard there's these grants available from the government? Uh, and I would encourage all listeners to be really alert to this sort of a thing. And they're business development grants. And basically they match you. So you spend five grand and they'll give you five grand. Mm -hmm. And they said, we, uh, we'll get you a, an assessment you can use the money for the assessment. No, we'll give you a free assessment. That's right. So federal government will give you a free assessment and we'll see where we go. So this guy came in um, and uh, his name is Stuart. I don't remember his last name, but an Adelaide guy. And he looked at the place and he said, you've really got something here. You've got all this history and it's got to be worth something. Um, there's this course coming up you should think about doing and it's called Design-Led Innovation. Hmm. And it's creative thinking, Right. What's your podcast about? This is kind of really spot on for your listeners. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a process called design-led innovation that has been developed. I don't know how long, but it's nothing really that new. Like everything, it's rehashed again. And it's basically creative thinking um, for helping you go forward and making plans and this sort of thing. And it involves, firstly, uh, looking at all your stakeholders in your business, yourselves uh, and your customers and that and doing what's called narrative interviews. So not surveying. So a survey, you put a thing out and people tick a box or whatever, and they're easy. Survey monkey things are free on the internet and they're wonderful and all that kind of stuff. Narrative interviews. Yeah, so we would sit down oh. with someone for one to two hours. There would be two of us and we would have a story that we would – because we want to know something from you. And what we had to do was to – before all of this, we had to plan our story out. And the story would be, I've got a rough idea who you are, Jen. So I would have someone who you might identify with in the story. And I would say, you know, Sally's doing this. She's home. She's got, uh, you know, she's a single parent. She's got her kids at home. And she's doing, you know, X. And you tell the story along. And then I'm, and we're listening for your reaction to the story. So we're kind of surveying you. And we're throwing ideas into it that are like, well, we really want to build a product that looks like why. And, um, and then, and then, you know, you get you as Jen to react for Sally to talk about it. So it's this little thing that allows you to be detached and give answers that you might not want to give because you want to please me, the interviewer, because you, you're a human and we all get asked questions and we want to answer them in a really nice way to make the interviewer happy. We want to not get eaten by the other person, you know, we're trying to make friends and all that. And so this, this, this sort of removes that and then you have this conversation and the nice thing about that conversation and doing it in such a relaxed time frame is you can say, well, why did you say that? And then you can say, well, tell me more about why you said that. And the idea is, I think Simon Sinek was, his thing was uh, start with a why. Yeah, I read that. It's a great book. Isn't it wonderful? So you want to ask five times basically. I mean, that's just a silly number, but you want to ask why enough times till you feel like they've run out of juice in explaining their story. Now, you can't do that in a survey. Mm. You can't follow... Um, a rabbit down the hole to find out what's going on in that person's life. Now, obviously, who you interview is important and you've got to think about that before you go and you need to do that a lot of times. So we did 60 of them over about 18 months as part of a course 
And so we did this design lead innovation course and part of it was you had to interview people all the time. And so that's a lot of investment in time. Mm. And uh, some of the interviews were quick. You know, there might have been five or ten minutes. Some of them were literally two or three hours and some of them we had lunch together. And and because of the two people there, one could be the engaged in the chat and the other could be getting the information and then you could good cop, bad cop it a little bit and swap whose roles it is. And um, it was mind-blowing. And so let's say this that course... Was fascinating. Yeah, it was put on by the state government, uh, this course... It was at the National Wine Centre every month for this, I didn't know how long it was, I can't even remember the length now. It started with about 30 different companies and ended up with about four or five of us. So, but when you're doing the interviews, are there other businesses there or you're just there? For you? It's homework. You go and do it yourself. Oh, okay. So yeah. part of the homework is you coming back with these results of these interviews. Right. And you're building a business and testing ideas and you should never stop doing it. The thing is, Good it's a training point. process to, to to listen to people properly, mm-hmm. and also to ask questions and be scientific about it, and not um, uh, try and second guess or or drop what you want them to say into the conversation. To be completely honest with them and to hear their, I mean, being honest at their narrative interviews, and you can tell people, I'm trying to get you this information out of you. You don't have to. You don't have to disguise it and cloak it in the story, mm. but they forget it and they just talk about the story very quickly. Yeah. Um, and it's a nice trick. And so we did this and in the end, so most people dropped out of it, those that didn't drop out of the course because it was very hard to keep up with. And it led us to a realisation that we're not in the making, and this is again back to Simon Sinek, we're not in the we make prints, we're in the in people people helping people understand their is sort of the memories and the history and no, not everyone fits with us. Not mm-hmm. everyone's nostalgic and um, and has a, a feel and a love for family. I mean, I totally get it. Family's a tough thing. But there's certain times in your life where you go through these sorts of things. And so I realise we connect with these people who probably like to collect vintage stuff. They maybe go to op shops or maybe they have beautiful things Hello. in the wall. <laughs> yeah. 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 So these are the we've sort of found who our people are, mm-hmm. and so then from that we know we need to present ourselves to suit them better. Mm-hmm. And so we stopped looking within our industry at all the ideas that other labs and photographers are asking or putting for, and we started looking outside the industry. And oh went, my gosh, I love you know, that home decor, fashion, um, collecting, um, uh, design. Uh, you know, beauty. Yeah. So you said, just going back a bit, you said the interviews went for like 18 months. We kept going. Well, and we haven't stopped doing them, frankly, but the formal ones were the part of the exercise was for the length of the course. Yeah. So we, we saw 60 people over that period or 60 pe- sometimes pairs of people um, over that period. I'll give you an example, if you like, of how one of them went. Yeah. It was a couple, they were neighbours of ours and they were a retired couple and uh, – we knew that we wanted to find about their ability and their desire to buy things online. And we said, you know, would you submit, you know, not we didn't say would you, but the question, the heart of the question is, would you send us your images online to print? And they, um, they said, no, no way, um, we wouldn't do that. And we said, well, you know, what's the story with that? Oh, look, my pictures aren't good enough. I don't need anything like that printed. And... Um, mm. And then so then we got them to show us some of the pictures and rather than say um, uh, your pictures are, you know, but rather than look at the pictures and, and sort of respond to that, we're, we're seeing them and going, well, that's a lovely picture. Tell me why that's important to you. Like, oh, it's because I, I know no one's smiling that, but that's the last picture we got of Aunt Harriet and look at, you know, she was a horrible person, but look there, she looks like she's got a glint in her eye and a blah, 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 blah. So that's nothing any robots could ever get. No AI sorting, no... no. I'll talk to you about that later, yeah, by I the know, way. That's coming. <laughs> but that's a, this is my feeling on it. This was an important thing to them that we sort of derived from all of this. So then we said, okay, so is, what about online spending? You know, oh, we booked our last trip to Europe on it. So tell me about that experience. Well, we had an online travel agent. Uh, they were pretty good. We ended up booking some of the stuff for the airlines. I said, well, in the end, how much money did you put through your credit card online? Oh, about 18 grand. Oh. And so I said, so online shopping's not your problem? Oh, no, that's nothing at all. We're, you know, happy and trustworthy of all of that sort of stuff. So, so you know, and so what we derived from is they wanted to sit down with someone who told them their 
pictures were important mm. and that um, they wanted to have that reinforced and be told that they're actually quite, they're quite nice pictures. You know, they're not – I can see that's not a great way everyone's smiling, but not every picture everyone has to smile. Mm. And people just wanted to be felt like they're being seen mm-hmm. and understood and then like let's just spend the money. That's You know, they're happy to. Now, I never felt that we're in a business that was – doing bad by people. I always wanted to be giving people stuff that would last forever. I believe in physical print because I think it's a wonderful thing to live with a simple image on the wall, Mm -hmm. to live with a simple image in your hand. When you look at a picture on the phone, you're scrolling, you're getting notifications. You probably photograph where you park the car Mm -hmm. or a receipt or maybe you paid bills through it or maybe you're sexting with your best friend and then there's pictures of your babies there as well. Like – it's super complicated, <laughs> phones. It is not a one-use device. Mm-hmm. A picture of your baby on the wall is a single-use device. And I really believe in that. So I've never felt that what we were doing was predatory or otherwise. So when I say, mm, now we've got a great client out of these people, it wasn't there to get them as a client. I just wanted to know whether that demographic, how they were thinking about photography. Mm-hmm. So they were retired, they were older than us, they were happy to throw money at the internet they just needed someone to hold their hand and to talk to them about their pictures. So that sort of helped us understand that kind of a client. So did the rebranding, did that take as long as or longer than what you thought? No, actually, I think Kate actually knew what she wanted to do pretty much from the beginning of that course. And Kate's your wife. My, my wife, yeah. Kate, yeah. I think what had happened, she had, she's miles ahead of me, right? And I think her a lot of her existence has been, steering me very slowly mm-hmm. <laughs> down a path that would be right. Now, I don't mean to – the part, she got a lot out of this course. We talk about this course fondly all the time mm-hmm. and we still think about it. In fact, she went back and taught with them. They didn't They didn't run it the same way again. Ours was the longest they ever did. It was a prototype. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was Amazing. about prototyping and rapid uh, – so part of the course was – rapid prototyping and changing. So the course itself was a prototype. It was hardly rapid though. This guy that came down from Queensland to teach us once a month and we spent time with him. Now she, he came back in the following year and then Kate went and was one of the sort of class mentors who helped the groups because you break off into little groups and you do those silly group exercises. Some of them are silly, mm. but they're all those things that we've done over the years, sometimes at high school and that just to try and get group dynamics working and then to spitball ideas and to, rapidly prototype ideas and so we would change something and we would take it to market and then we would stop doing like we made a whole product with a website and everything and and got subscribers and never went anywhere with it and stopped it and then pivoted Mm -hmm. so and it was not and it was also being able to let go of that idea so the course was amazing Mm. Um, and there are you will see design-led innovation listed places there's some wonderful books that came over and it's all about creative thinking and it's the way creatives think. If you're a painter, how you work about going, putting uh, oil on the canvas and all that kind of stuff, there's a process that this is echoed in in this same thing. Right. And funnily enough, like we've been through some – and financial industry, you know, what a monster city that happens to be, um, but they've been through a period where they don't understand, and they're in it now, what's driving the economy and how it works. You know, post-COVID, it's all like, what do we do? No one knows. Mm. But one thing they do know is we need to think in a very different way. And so these institutions, these you know, these old school employing creative thinkers and people who've done courses like design-led innovation to help find out what's coming next, what will work. So for us, it was it was amazing. You know, it Kate knew what she kind of knew what she wanted to do. It was kind of reaffirmed. She wanted to make something that was more home friendly and more focused on on people's emotions and less on we just make prints. Mm. And um, and nostalgia is a big thing. If you've um, – did you watch Mad Men? Yeah. You remember the carousel episode yes. where he's selling the Kodak yes. projector? Yes, yeah. Someone sent that to me not that long ago. Yeah. Right. yeah. So that Kodak wanted to call it the wheel. Well, this is the story. I don't know what the truth is. And Don Draper comes up and it's the carousel. And if you watch that episode, we should have a link to it in the – Yes, we should. Because there's a YouTube clip of it. I think yeah. I can get it for you. I will uh, yeah. link to it. Because yeah. it is like you sit there and you just about tear up listening to him talk. You know, I can relate to the rebranding thing because I used to be Jennifer Sando photography. So I kind of had to um, – but I did take a – when I had my second child, I took a long break from 
the industry and found it hard to get back in because by that time there's like a whole new wave of, you know, younger photographers, different equipment. Um, I mean, not a lot of the, you know, the, what photography is about, not a lot of that um, changes, but it's, it was a long break that I took and, the, you know, my passion sort of comes in drips and drabs but uh, I do a lot of comparing to how things used to be for me, you know, where I'm going with this. I just wanted to comment on the rebranding thing because I think that's maybe why I felt the rebrand so hard because I have my own thing going on with that. You know how some people do it because they feel that, like, it, they just feel like it's time for the business to have a new direction, but yours just looked well thought out but I had no idea that mm. like that process was behind it but thank you we were trying to be well I, I this might help listeners to understand so my grandfather was a, like a gambler drinker party guy super great salesman knew everyone everyone was his friend um grandma was like dude you've got to we need money. I've got <laughs> kids and we got – she had five children. We need, you need to get your act together. Um, and so she started doing things like hand-colouring photographs. So people wanted to see the pictures with the grass being green and horses being brown and all that kind of stuff. She was hand-colouring, great artist. Um, then she got sick of that and she said to Dad, uh, who was – so their son John, the second son – was, was working the business, you're smart, go and work out colour. So this was like in the early 60s. She did this to your father. To my dad, yeah, yeah. and to the grandfather who was too busy having a party to really care, <laughs> but he handed the money over. Mm-hmm. Dad goes out and works out colour. Um, and it was a big thing back then. It required different chemistry and thinking and real logic and scientific approach and sort of you, that granddad was always winging it. Uh, Dad was like, no, 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 I can't do this. He was used to being an unstable growing up and he needed stability. Mm. So he built stability. Mm -hmm. And then mum comes in. So it's the women that always fix – this is the moral of the story. The women always fix our business. Mum comes in and says, (laughs) John, this is a freaking mess. You need to make this look professional. And so she was the one that made us a lab, as in white lab coats, perfectly clean, walls painted. The Technicolor, we had these beautiful front counter made out of – it was this grey with smoked glass and it was all kind of stylish. And So she drove that aesthetic and that people come to you if you look like you're the part. Mm. Whereas dad was like, he was just trying to get the technical stuff done and grandfather was like, yeah, give me some more money. Glug, glug, hick, hick, let's have I a party. I didn't realise that. I thought it was your father's business. I didn't realise it went back to your grandfather. Well, as far as the lab, my granddad, while he did do processing and printing, he was predominantly working for himself as a general photographer and he was a horse racing photographer, but he was also weddings and commercial. Um, back then a photographer photographed for the police. There was no police. So he did dead bodies and car crashes. Oh, and so yeah. he did all the processing wow. for that and Dad did the processing for that. Mm. But it was Dad who was like, I got colour worked out. And then a few people came to him and said, you really got colour worked out. I'm going to send my work to you. And so the colour stuff was what opened us up and – and then it was mum was like, you need to make this look good. And then I was in there and I brought digital in because it was like around 2000, mid-90s when I started on that. And all I wanted to do was for digital to be as good as the best colour could be. Mm-hmm. And so I worked really hard on everything you needed to make that happen and we got the best technology and all that sort of stuff. But I think I was just lost in a world of, like Dad was, technically sorting it out. But also making sure grandfather was happy and dad was happy and mum was happy and grandma was happy, you know. And there's a lot of people to worry about. So mm. so as I took on the business more and more and they gave me shares and it got more important, they knew that they could rely on me to look after them, to keep their money flowing. Now, my grandfather had already been cut off by my father because the bank said, we cannot give you no more money because my grandfather's like, hey, here we go, another party. And mm. it's great fun and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, so dad – got into some financial difficulties and had to stop granted taking money. So dad had this thing about being really careful about money and everything. So as as I took over that, it was like, well, I gotta look after all this stuff and, you know, carry it very gently and make them happy, then the pressure of my family comes in to bear. And mm. it's like, how do you deal with that? And you deal with that by saying, Dad, 
you know, what he said to his father, you got to go. So we bought, we bought the building uh, and this is after the rebranding. So mm -hmm. the rebranding had happened and it would kind of was doing okay but you could feel we'd gotten something going here. But we could, you knew that the business couldn't afford, you know, four good incomes. Uh, you know, the business couldn't afford, you know, all the things that happened. We needed somewhere to live. Um, we, we had a nice house, a uh, beautiful house um, in a nice suburb in Adelaide. But we, we had to sell that and, and everything to be able to buy the building. Mm, now, the problem okay. is mum and dad lived above it in the apartment. And it was like, okay, it's not going to work if they're still there because I'm going to be thinking about them every five minutes. They need to move. And that was their home. And I mentioned the financial difficulty um, a little few minutes ago. That financial difficulty left them to not have a house either. And they ended up putting everything into the building and to the apartment above it, which was a series of offices that they converted to an apartment. So if I want to feel bad about myself, I say that was their lifeboat. They built this little thing that they could look after themselves in. And they did a beautiful job. And I was in my mid-20s when they did that and all that kind of stuff. But then Kate and I needed it. We needed the lifeboat. Mm. So we – and they were – they didn't owe anything. So that really wasn't a problem. Uh, so we needed to get all the money together and give them all the money so they would go away nicely. And that wasn't very pleasant. They didn't want to leave. Mm. They were happy not to be in the business, but they didn't want to leave their home. Yeah, right. So that was my big tragedy that I've had to go through. Now, I'm the luckiest guy on earth. There's no sympathy, please. It's like, But my story is that I, you know, moved them on. They moved to Port Douglas and Cairns. Um, where dad developed leukemia within six months and Ooh. died a few years later. So he died last, not last, yeah, actually, yeah, I 18 that. months today. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. it was uh, a year and six months ago. Mm. Um, and that was, you know, he didn't associate that with me. I don't associate that death with him. He didn't want to be in far north Queens. I mean, if he had to be somewhere else, he was happy to be by a beach looking at the sea. So that was tickety-boo, but... The reality is that they wanted to be where they were and not be disturbed. And yeah, right. That was what happened. And I spoke to them every week and we kept contact and I've been up lots of times. It was very difficult but, you know, we died with – he died with a great uh, – with, with a great relationship, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm helping mum and all that kind of stuff, being a good son. Yeah. Um, so that's, that cycle has led us to being living above the business in this little self-contained little lifeboaty thing but it doesn't feel that way for us it feels very expansive and very exciting that was i was going to ask you like what is it you know um do you find it hard to switch off from the business when you're living yeah yeah it's it's impossible but do you have to put boundaries like how do you do it i don't think you can mm. I, I know because you you work at home yeah we're here in your kitchen yeah living room um yeah i don't think you can and i i actually think in my heart the the more you fight to think you need those boundaries or people tell you you need those boundaries the worse it feels i think the more you embrace right. it as who you are and you go no 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 i work from home like i can wear my jammies to work you know mm. the more you you roll into it i think it because half of our life is worrying about what we shouldn't shouldn't be doing, I yep. think. I Another half of doing it. Yeah. And I think letting go of that stuff, it is hard, but we've gotten to a point now, and it and it, you know, it was really destructive a few years ago. But when we got a someone, we promoted someone up to a higher level, and it was a lady who'd been working us with us forever. We got photographs of her and I at 19 together in the mm -hmm. business. So I knew her before I knew Kate. We promoted her to general manager a couple of years ago. And it's like, ooh. I don't actually have to pay much attention anymore. I can relax a bit. Now, I'm sorry you can't do that. You know, I'm thinking that perhaps artificial assistance and AI will help with that because there's a lot you can do now you can give to the robots. I, <laughs> I need help with um, still embracing that whole uh, concept. I was going to ask you, now that we're on the topic, like... How do you feel about it, AI and the photo industry? Like it's, uh, yeah, I, I need to have my hand held through the whole thing. Like I'm just, um, like I'm kind of easing into it in the way that like I use Lightroom to process my photos. Um, 
and you know they they they're putting in those little the, the AI features and so I'm I'm kind of using it to Have an you used extent. the face the the people the face detecting yeah yeah, yeah. use all of that so it's I killer. guess it it's crazy like it is making my workflow easier and I think it's really important for us all to have enormous empathy in this time of change and sympathy for all those people that are getting mashed about by it. Um, a similar mashing about happened, though, when 35mm cameras came into photography um, and mini labs, you know, they kind of crushed so much of our business before digital and digital crushed our business. And, you know, it took us to having 50 staff down to seven or 12 oh, or whatever. Oh, wow. So, yeah. And it wasn't an instant I don't think any, I mean, I'm sure that's the case, but I doubt many people have instantly lost their jobs to AI. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of muck being made by it. It's not refined at the moment, is it? It's kind of, you know, when you get it to write things, you go, oh, I can sort of see that's a bit of a mess. Um, but I think, and this is, it's going to be a terrible transition for a lot of people. Yeah. It, it's going to be hard. I think we're going to be fine, though, at the end. Uh, whatever, however long that takes. And, of course, however long it takes is usually getting quicker and quicker. That's just one of the things that happens. But it still takes, you know, um, Warhol had a bunch of people working for him, but Warhol didn't put one of his pieces on the wall that he didn't say was okay. He didn't mix his own paints particularly, whereas the generation before that they were mixing their own oils. And so that they were being, buying pre-bought paint and... They, were, they weren't probably making their screen inks as well, but, you know, generation before that, they probably, they didn't have screen printing, but they were had their own way of doing it. So everything, we're always suffering from something which is coming over and pecking at us. But mm. in the end, it was Warhol that said, this is good enough to put on the wall. Now, it's a bad example because, you know, these outstanding artists, um, you know, musicians or whatever they might be, there's the very few of them, but there's all of us that are making average stuff. Uh, but still, it's when we say, that's fine, I'm going to show it. Who says to stop and say it's fine, that's where the skill and the love and everything goes into it. How you got there, whether it be AI or f hiring a Photoshop specialist or hiring other writer to tidy up your messy writing or an editor or something like that, whatever the correct terminology is, you still are putting that thing out. And I think people can see the word salads at the moment that are AI and they go, and I think it's making people not read and it's, they're getting their radars coming up inside the this, this subconscious saying, this is just muck. Mm. So they're not reading that, but what they probably are doing is hunting out better quality writing or more genuine writing. Um, There's a kind of hope to that. That actually sounds hopeful. I'm very hopeful, whether that's right or not. I don't see any point in... You can't fight it. What can you do? Mm. Like they've already let it go. Like as soon as they privatised, I mean, chat GP, GTP was meant to be public and then they privatise it behind the, the the guy that invented its back. Mm. And it's like, oh, well, what do you do now, corporation? Mm. So, yes, there is some terrible stuff happening, but I think more than ever now the, I feel like there's genuine power flowing back into original creators, just not fast enough, just like political power, you know, I think I don't think money's, you know, big money has really got long for control, I think that we're breaking that slowly. Mm. And I think, you know, politically we're seeing less of an influence from these and people know these games and the generation of the, you know, the, the right wing and the, the of the, their, their time is over. It's more of an opportunity to go with your intuition in those, um, yeah. uh, in, in those moments, I think. I think so. Yeah. I think so. So I think we're just, there's going to be a lot of, like every bit of change, there's going to be a lot of victims. Mm. And some of those victims uh, haven't seen the better side of it yet and they're just suffering and unfortunately their suffering might be making it harder, but there's nothing to do about that. You've got to go through your process. Um, so, yeah, yeah I'm, 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 I am hopeful. I just don't know how long this is all going to take and what's the carnage going to be in the meantime. <laughs> so you were saying before that you... Um, yeah, you provide services for photographers and that is how we connected because I had a wedding photography business for a few years. I still do um, family events but not so much the weddings, not, not like I used to. So I would come in to your lab and um, get my stuff processed there and you were always 
friendly and welcoming and noticed that, you know, big advocate for artists can really feel that. But you were also a really big supporter of my Eddie project. Which I love. I still, <laughs> to this day, I smi- it makes me smile. It's really incredible that you did that and it's just shows you how big a voice you actually have. <laughs> yeah. You know, to put, you really pulled a bunch of people together to do something. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, you know, it's a really cute thing you did too. Like it, it wasn't – it was beautiful. Like it was there for its own sake. It wasn't there – you weren't trying to change the world or anything, you know, like that. you were just yeah. doing something beautiful. Oh, thanks for saying that. After I did the project, I then was moving to the book stage and I came and saw you and you schooled me up on black and white printing. A lot of it went in one, one ear and out the other, I have to say. But, the book worked fine. looks great. Um, but it was nice to just to, you know, to have that conversation with you and see your passion in, you know, with printing. It all came out in that conversation. And with you being a big supporter of local artists and you've been involved in quite a few exhibitions and I was in one of yours, the yeah. Dark, the Dark yeah. exhibition, yeah. Do you, have you had like the – been favourite exhibitions? Wow. wow, that's a tough one. I, it's funny because those things follow how you're feeling at the time and the, what we did with the dark and light were just two, two ones that followed. And I kind of wanted them to be keep going and roll on, but they to do it properly, it has to be your thing and you have to – and I didn't feel I was quite 100% my thing. And so I was hooked in with um, – Tony Canny, mm-hmm. who has a series that he's been running, I think it's called Rust, Salt, Tar, and you can see Dark Light. And I consulted Tony. It wasn't an, an intellectual property copyright type of thing. I consulted him about it and he suggested that I do something simple like this and follow his model. But Tony does it and he does it really well and he pulls a diverse group of people. I did not want it to be just about us. Mm. And I think from a marketing perspective I felt that I was going to provide a vehicle for our customers to go to a bigger stage who are contemporary artists or, or wedding photographers who have an art bend or because mm. everyone gets into photography uh, not to shoot weddings or whatever. They get into it because they like taking pictures about mm-hmm. whatever, you know, yes. it just happens to be you end it's up where you end up. private battle there, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's incredible, isn't it? Mm. You know, you, you end up doing stuff that you don't – and it can make your love of photography go away. Mm. Yeah, I was kind of hinting at that before, but I still um, have trouble admitting that because I don't want to sound like I'm not grateful Mm. for the talent I have. Um, But it's been hard to sustain that passion because, yeah. I think it's smart to, if you're feeling that, I think the, the, the butterfly that is creative and the creative skill that you can imagine, I think protecting that by walking away and getting a job at Coles or whatever you need to do <laughs> is much smarter because that thing to nurture and bring out at other times in your life is great, but to actually squash it is a really sad thing. And it's nice, yeah. it's so easy for me to say those words because I'm not living needing money and I'm not facing needing to pack, you know, shelves at Coles. Um, but the, that thing is so beautiful and so important to so many people that – preserving and protecting it is something that I think it's really worth doing. Yeah. And we've had, and it's, uh, I've had a lot of experiences over the last, all my life of seeing people coming at it, going from the industry and not every exit is graceful and, you know, people have a terrible time with it and they hate themselves for letting it get that far and they end up doing mercenary practices to get work in. They become someone who they're not. They do high-pressure sales and that just shuts their customer base down. I've seen that too, mm. but I just realised you would, yeah, you would definitely see a lot more of mm. that and have you just accepted that that's just part of the Yeah, yeah, I think it's industry. important to do yeah. that. And there is a certain amount of um, – the mobile phone industry, call it churn, where people hop between carriers all the time. Mm. It's quite a good term. It's, it's turnover, but it's churning through. And so you do have people coming and going because that's, they just don't love it. I mean, I think everyone should love photography, so I'm really a crap person to ask about this. But I've sort of 
uh, come to the understanding that people don't all love photography and they have their different experiences with it. And so if I just show how much I enjoy it and it's good fun and support people where I want to, then we'll get that. But people still go uh, and you come in contact with them and they go different paths and they our paths diverge. And, mm. um, but, yeah, we've had people, we've seen people go into real desperate situations with their photography and just get themselves into an awful state. And the, I think, you know, the worst, that the thing that upsets me the most is the people that are ageing out of the industry. I'm not talking about particularly old people, but certain work is for certain ages. Weddings is not really for 60-year-old photographers. If you can't connect with a young couple and be like mates and all that kind of stuff and that sort of thing where they feel like they, they know you and they want you around, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. it, otherwise, it's a very um, transactional thing, which it's, that's an okay business, but I don't think it turns into a, a love of doing weddings. So I think naturally there is a – you say goodbye to weddings at a certain point in your life when you start looking at the bunting – and the mason jars or whatever it might be this year and you roll your eyes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember speaking to one photographer who was looking at the bridal party at a wedding fair coming towards them and they're all young, they're all excited, they're all excited to spend 80 grand on this party. And you go – and you look at them and you go, do you really want to do this? Like, dude, elope. You know, and it's, I think that's the death of weddings for you as a photographer if you're feeling that way. Yeah. Yes, it's a lot of money and it feels like an awful waste and a third, first world magical bean thing that we can actually have $80,000 parties. But people have the money and they want to do it and we should be excited for them for that. Mm -hmm. If you're not, you shouldn't be a wedding photographer anymore. <laughs> yeah, and like I'm going to just be, have a, like just say something a little bit vulnerable and I may edit this out later, I don't know, <laughs> but I actually, because um, we have a mutual friend, Claudio Rochella. Who like, I was talking to this morning. Oh, were you? Well, he messaging says, with. Oh, were you? But, you know, I was hoping that we would have a three-way, but, you know. Next time. So. Um, he is so talented. And I had the privilege of assisting him last weekend at a wedding and you know it was a beautiful wedding you know I I'm I'm, I'm observing because I don't have because I wasn't shooting I had was thinking about you know you have your thoughts going on I have my own the journey that I've been through with my divorce and it was really I still find it hard to uh you know be present at a wedding mm. ceremony and not have that my internal thoughts. Do you feel like of... warning the couple? <laughs> I mean, what's the stats these days? I heard I'm somewhere not... like if 50% get divorced or maybe it's like 55 <laughs> don't get divorced, right? How many of that percentage left that stay married are happily married and in, and who, who's hanging around for the kids and, yeah, don't think I'm, about I'm it. I'm going to put that out as an open question. You can... Don't, don't think know. about it. Uh, I know. And it's just, it's like... It's interesting because you, you know, you hear the vows and that and you th thoughts start and it's like, mm, I thought I'd process that. <laughs> I look like I need to do really? more work there. But, um, you know, I'm a romantic at heart so when I listen to the speeches and I get all, some of them I tear up at and I'm just like, oh, my God, Geneva, just calm yourself down. Like I've obviously got a heart, I can feel things. But, yeah, that was that was um, really interesting to to be at that wedding with Claude because he pretty much everything that I feel like, everything I know about um, people photography, I learned from Claude and so I kind of view him as a mentor, which is really cool. I think he is. And he, you know what? He's one of these people who's still shooting weddings and he is, you know, I just said that you age out of weddings. Yeah. What is it with him? Like he's he actually doesn't do them as much. No, I know. He but, rarely does them. But when them. you mentioned before about those photographers that don't, Claude's, you know, he I know. gets uh, it with the connection. He does. People. He yeah. does. He gets it. And this is the problem. I, where I was going with that story about people ageing out of it, they hang on and then they blame the younger generation and they get, I mean, I think it's mostly male photographers, mm. mostly older male photographers. In fact, that's the problem of the world, isn't old men? Um, but they're hanging on for their dear life. <laughs> for, that's me I'm talking about too. They're hanging on for their dear life for these ideas that they had that worked 30 years ago. Therefore, that's not Claudio. Yeah. Claudio is 
he lives in the moment and he's with the passion on the day. And I think the challenge to you would be to see those vows as poetry. Yeah. And at the moment, that's how everyone is feeling. What mm. the frick's wrong with that? Yeah. That is the most beautiful thing yeah. that they felt. And you know what the second best thing is in the world is people who can do a divorce well. Um, that, that the can, conscious uncoupling. I love, I mean, I, the whole <laughs> uncoupling ceremony is like a bit more, you know. But the whole idea that you can be friendly for your kids and be adult and then have your own relationships going your own way but still get together and say, hey, we did this thing together. Mm, yeah. How freaking crazy. It's only the pressures we put on ourselves and we feel society puts on us that makes this thing all go to hell mm. in a handbasket and gets us to clutch on for dear life. It's like everything. It's about letting go and being right there then at the moment. Mm, and that's what yeah. Claudio is. He is yeah. right there. And, you know, he, he, we would sit down with – we go to lunch, three of these, four of us. Yeah. And we're all old guys. Yeah. Well, not old, but, you know, like in that in that range. I can guess who was there, but we don't need to go into no, it. No, we don't. Um, <laughs> but there would be a lot of there's, – there's, it's often quite a bit of, oh, this person's doing that, look what he's doing for that. And, you know, you sound, we sound like a three old men. And the person who doesn't know, understand any of the gossip, who doesn't know who we're talking about, who doesn't give – is Claude yeah. every single time. Yeah, yeah. It's I like, well, what it. is that? Who's that? Huh? What? And it's like he's just there, right there. Yeah. For what he's doing then, and it is magic. Yeah. He's a very rare person. And you opened his exhibition mm. um, a few years back. So that was – and I didn't I didn't know that you were opening. So when I went to the event and I was like, oh, there's Paul. He's the perfect person to give the whole welcoming spiel. So, I mean, that just went right in with your mm. support for local – Artistry. Thanks. Thanks. I fall over myself for people like Claude. I, you know, if he said, "Can we go to lunch tomorrow?" I'd be, <laughs> like, yeah, I'd drop everything. You know, um, and, and my mum, the first piece of contemporary photographic art she ever bought was one of Claude's. Oh, the, probably really? the last one she bought. Oh my gosh! As I a didn't woman know that. smoking at Ruby's. It was Claude's exhibition at Ruby's Cafe, which used to be in East Rundle Street, and I think it was a fringe event. Yeah. Probably back in the mid nineties, early nineties. We'll have to link to Claude's website so it doesn't sure. sound like a, an inside, you know, an inside conversation. <laughs> um, boats. Oy. Your love for boats. Where did, how did that come about? Well, okay, that's a good question. Um, I think it was just a, an original escape from the family business thing. What can I do that's very not the family? But then again, I say that, but then Dad built a boat when he was 16 so I built my first boat when I was 19. So I think there uh-huh. may have been a bit of competitiveness there. Uh-huh. But his boat was a kind of boat. Mine is uh, – mine. the boats that I like are very romantic and they're very tied to the past and might, they might be built with modern methods but they're just they're, – they're beautiful renderings of a, a whole lot of ideas that have come together. You know, there's this wonderful uh, – John Steinbeck, the writer, mm-hmm. um, he, he wrote about boats and this is one of the things that gets me every time was that he was once uh, interested in what society thinks of boats and why boats are still something that gets people, some people. He said he went down into the stores, and this is back in the, um, I gather it would be the 50s, 60s, like Macy's in the US or um, one of the great department stores at any rate, where they actually sold fishing gear and boats and all that kind of stuff. And he stood in the department and he watched people walk up to the boat that was sitting there being sold and it was a little wooden boat and people would all rap on the hull three times, knock, knock, knock. And he and he and he then once went to the furniture department and they never knocked on the piano or knocked on the sideboard. They always knocked on the boats. And he postulated that it's because it's deep in our after the first time we left home as as a culture, we left our little camps and we went somewhere and great journeys were done in boats. It's mm. the first machines that were be, were made. Otherwise we walked, right? carried our stuff and walked, but we wanted across the ocean, across the river, we made a boat. And so there's this thing that he, that Steinbeck postulated that was deep in, deep within us that we had to see that it was safe by knocking on it. And it felt, oh, yeah, that sounds great. It's going to be okay. Mm. And um, I, that's sort of a, I think for me it's that. It's, it's so deep in my soul that I just love them. They're, so, they're such elegant, simple things. So, yeah, that's my, my boat thing. And you referred to your upstairs area as a lifeboat. Well, yeah, I didn't think I noticed about that. that. 
such a yeah yeah so. a lot of my metaphors come from that you know being anchored to to something um sa- sailing you know in a storm the, the boat is safest out of a harbor in a mm. storm they're not they don't want to be tied up they're better being out in the storm and working around it um you can never with sailing you can never go exactly where you want to go you're always tacking off be trying to get there um whereas a motorboat you can kind of drive there but even then something's going to stop you so you've got to change your plans so that's life isn't it yeah yeah and you know what i've never been i mean aside from ferries i've never actually been on a boat you might hate it you know they're that's a bit up like, and downy. i know i should try it but that's kind of why i've just you know what this we can save this well yeah don't day. let my story i'm not here pro- pro- trying to convert people to be boat lovers I'm just, no 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 um, there's just something about them that i just can't get out of my head mm. i just can't shake it you know so you have your your own podcast through. Is it an Atkins branded podcast? Yeah, it's, we call it the Labcast. Okay, um, it is, and we've kind of. And this uh, is you and Kate. Yeah, well, we it was Kate's. It hasn't run regularly for a year now, mm. um, and mostly because it's actually really hard to get both of us in tune, as in, on the same wavelength to to because we would have a chat together like you and I are doing, and then. I'd interview somebody and then we'd come back together and review the interview together. Oh, because um, I'd only listen to – Yeah. Did you do that for every single – We episode? did. We did that. Oh. But then we stopped for maybe a year or maybe longer than that and I did maybe 30 or so episodes of that format and then I was like, no, Kate and I are just going to talk together mm. and then I'm going to interview someone. So we're going to alternate the interviews. We're going to do interview one week – Chat the ne- Kate and I chat the next week, and whether we talk about the interview, we talk about the, the closing of the show succession, mm-hmm. which we did do. They would be, um, uh, you know, like that. We just go with the flow and how we feel, and it was just something that. And and for us, we she didn't want to sit down in front of a microphone. Mm. It was for her because she's got ADHD, and she's like, I just can't. You can't <laughs> make me perform now. I can't do this. And she's also she diagnosed with autism the last few years. And so she, her life and with other people has been a performance and she's been really good at it. People love her and want her to do the Kate thing. Mm. And it's not her, right? But she's only realised that she, it, it's so hard on her to do that. And she's now reworking exactly what she is. She can still do that when she wants to, but sitting in front of the microphone was making her do that. And so we, um, we said, okay, let's do it when we walk the dog. So I built a rig with lapel you mics did not. to walk the dog and to talk while we're walking. I love that. And it was it, it is great. It does work really well, but we've just not been able to strike it because the ends of the day sometimes when we walk the dog and at night have been so exhausting, the thought of then putting a conversation together. And I found editing it was hard too because extra background noise. Oh, okay. Yeah, you just mean... Oh, the that noise. and two microphone echo, mm-hmm. um, like it was yeah. really. Hard. But we've done a few of them, and the format is awesome. And we're gonna do, we're gonna do more, and we're gonna do it when we're driving, you know, car trip, road trips, and that kind of stuff, and just you record conversations about things because she's got a very good analytical brain. She thinks completely differently to the, what I do. Mm-hmm. She's much more aware of um, of social situations of. Um, political, cultural change and that kind of stuff. And so she's got some great thoughts on that. She's very progressive. And both my daughters are as well. Like they're amazing, Why, miles ahead of me. And I'm now the silly old man in the corner that they have to come and tell me what's going on. <laughs> and they go, oh, that's what that means. Yeah. you know. And then I'm, I'm just trying to be as open and as learny-learny as possible and not be that crusty old man I've just been railing against <laughs> this whole podcast. <laughs> well, I don't think that you have – crusty old man vibes today <laughs> I've, today I've thank you, you. Good, good. <laughs> i haven't seen you in a while like no, it's no, been no, no. a long I, time it has been a while yeah yeah yeah, yeah crusty old man vibe I, I look i think that's my only thing i want to do now um like personally in my, my life is not to fall into that trap of of um of being you know in that situation where people could look at me and go yeah you're not accepting of what's going on you're not willing to listen to you know young people and what they want i don't want to be it's that a person. real thing like i can almost feel myself i mean like i want i don't want to actually label myself as a 
Crusty or 35 old. year old, or whatever you are. <laughs> 27, you. wasn't it? Oh, I love it. I thank you. Remember. We're not going there either, but okay. uh, thank you. Um, because, yeah, huge generation gaps, and I see it with my, my 15 year old, and um, yeah, big culture shifts. So I kind of want to stay balanced to just immerse myself in some of that world. But, you know, what you were saying before about nostalgia, sometimes I look at my life as one kind of like nostalgic journey. So I have to, you know, I think best way to get out of that is to stay present, which I find really hard to do. What are your future plans for Atkins? I, I think um, being ready for change and being responsive is the thing. Um, I'm terrible at change. Uh, it's my biggest uh, problem is, you know, so I'm – and it's so for me to survive that is to trust people who are better at change and to let them do their thing and then to help them and to still be the person that they can turn to to be carrying the load of nostalgia with them mm-hmm. and to make that – bridge and I'm cool with that like I'm great at carrying nostalgia and I think I can teach I think I've taught my kids who are are 18 and 20 what about what's nostalgia and what's important about it and Mm. what's not important I think that's that's there Um, and they have such a thing for old photographs and they love it they take pictures themselves quite a lot but I think they get that so that's my job Mm -hmm. so I can't What's next for Atkins is to for me to be as limber and as responsive as possible to make sure that we can afford to do whatever exciting thing we want to do because I do a bit of financial controlling, which just is the worst thing in the world. I hate I hate all that stuff, but mm. I feel like I can put myself – that's my that's my thing i got to deal with. Yeah. Um, they can dream and should be able to dream without worrying too much about that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, they should be able to go out and break things. My, one of the things that – Really, I loved about my dad the most is he said once, Kate should be allowed to do nothing all day and sit and stare and just – she should do whatever she wants because that's when the great ideas come out, not when you're dragging yourself to yeah. work at nine in the morning. You know, you've got to be easy on yourself. So I just want to be able to facilitate that sort of thing for her and for Mandy and the other team. And if I can do that, that's cool because I think the business will be fine. Uh, as long as you're responsive and not clinging to the past and making sure nothing changes because it's going to all change. Yeah. Well, I've got a, like, potential slogan. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, Atkins, not run by crusty old men. <laughs> Take that Here you go. That, that sort of, <laughs> Not you know. run by crusty old men. I like it. In fact, you know the CEO is our dog. We've got him. He's on the top of the organisational chart, Frankie. The, the, Aww. Yeah, yeah. He's the he's a Cavalier King Charles cross with a poodle. <gasps> Really? Oh, yeah. good thing. I have both well, I've had three dogs in the past and they were all cavies. I've yeah. got a soft spot for cavies. Well you can it's the big eyes, isn't it? It is. Yeah, Frank's amazing. So he they're actually run by Krusty, you know, I won't tell you what he does, but he's a dog, you know what yeah. dogs do. Um but yeah, that that that's what I want to do. <laughs> so not run by Krusty Elman. That's good. I'll take that. If you weren't running a photo lab though, what would you be doing? Oh God, that's a hard one. I really don't know. Look, I might, I might be, a, I might have been a boat builder or a, um, like working on a tugboat or like a captain of a freighter or something exciting. I think it's very romantic, but I don't know if the reality is that much fun. But there's a guy on TikTok I watch who's a captain of a freighter, and I look at him and go, "Oh, I could do that." And he's just so great the way he talks about where the containers go on the ship and where he sleeps, and he's he's very engaging, and it's like. You can see there's this whole world that I could have been a part of. Yeah. Because I really, you know, I, was, I thought of joining the Navy and all that kind of crap. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I just didn't have the courage for that bigger change. Yeah. Um, so there's like, you know, as far as retirement is concerned, would you consider a career change no then? No way. <laughs> no, no, no. But I do consider disappearing on a boat to be an imperative. I don't think it's a career thing, but it's a, mm. where's Paul? Oh, you know, he'll be on it some, somewhere. Oh, right, to like the end of Shawshank Redemption. Like That's what, it. I've got like an Boat's image of that. Yep. Yep. That'll do. Yeah. That'll do. What do you reckon? Good, good, good note to Very good to note end. to end it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for um, chatting with me today. Pleasure. You made it really easy. 
and um, lots of little nuggets in there that I can package and cool. share. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Jen. All the best Thank for you. Atkins and, um, uh, and your family. Thank you very much. Thank you.